Bună dimineața Europa, bună dimineața europeni! În caz de nu mai țineți cont de zilele săptămânii, astăzi este luni. Cândva o zi plină de dușmani, dacă este să credem peretele Facebook-ului. Astăzi, redusă la statutul de doar o altă zi din săptămână. Ziua de luni este una din victimele pandemiei. Ah, am zis pandemie. Știu că mulți deja aveți aversiune la acest cuvânt. Dar astăzi vreau să discutăm modelul suedez de luptă împotriva pandemiei. Un model atât de mult discutat în jurul lumii, încât epidemiologul suedez Tegnell a devenit superstar mondial, cu fan cluburi și tatuaje cu chipul său în cele mai ciudate locuri pe corpul uman. Un model a dus în discuție și în România, alături de întrebarea Noi de ce nu implementăm acest model? Sau alături de critici foarte, foarte dure. La această întrebare vreau să vă răspundeți singuri în spiritul gândirii critice, în urma discuției pe care o voi avea alături de invitații emisiunii Oana Argir, tânără activistă de profesie farmacist din Suedia, și Gabriel Gustafsson Hall, tânăr doctor ce lucrează în departamentul de boli infecțioase în Suedia. Pe Oana, colega mea din USR Diaspora, am observat în urma activităților de a colecta fonduri pentru spitalele din România, iar pe Gabriel, îl cunosc din timpul străvechi, când amândoi eram delegați de tineret la Consiliul Europei pentru Suedia, respectiv Danemarca. Vom începe cu un dialog în limba română alături de Oana și vom continua cu un dialog în limba engleză alături de ambii invitați. Thank you both for joining the podcast this morning. I hope you had your coffee already. Uh, let's uh, let our the people that are listening to us, let's let them know how are you involved with the pandemic? Uh, Gabriel, would you like to start? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Gabriel Gustafsson Hall. I am a resident doctor in infectious disease at a small hospital in Visby on the island of Gotland in the Baltic Sea. I've been involved working directly with COVID patients at the hospital, uh, receiving them at the emergency room and in the ward, but also doing some uh, preventive and uh, contact tracing, finding new cases uh, by testing relatives to someone who tests positive in the society to gain an idea of how common it is spread in the community. Thank you. And uh, Wana? Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Wana Argir. As you said, uh, I work in the pharmacy in Sweden. Um, I had some contact with the patients with COVID-19, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the idea was here um, basically to, if someone was infected and they didn't have any resources to send someone else to the pharmacy for their medicines, um, they would have called the pharmacy in advance. Uh, we would have prepared their medication and then someone from the pharmacy would meet them on the street um, in front of the pharmacy uh, with the um, proper um, with a mask and uh, yeah, not getting too close to that person. So that was basically what we could have helped them with. Um, but in the same time, um, all the communities uh, have helped as much as possible from neighbors that uh, offered to help them uh, to uh, city halls that had more people to help in helping them to the Red Cross that had more people and more uh, teams to help them. Um, yeah. Okay, mulțumesc, Oana. Uh, acum... Să începe puțin cu, cu întrebare către Oana, vom avea dialogul în limba română așa cum am promis. Uh, Oana, modelul suedez, așa cum l-am perceput eu la, de la distanță, mă rog, de la distanță din Danemarca, <laughs> este un model semi-relaxat în care nu există interdicții și în care afacerile nu s-au închis. Uh, granițele îți deschise, în sensul că lumea poate să vină în Suedia, dar nu poate să plece, că rest celelalte granițe sunt exact. închise. Școlile sunt deschise, barurile, restaurantele, cafenelele, sale de sport, poaforurile, până și cinematografele sunt deschise. Într-un fel, în timp ce restul lumii își schimba major modul de viață, în Suedia lucrurile au rămas la fel. La, în Danemarca, percepția este că acest model este unul sinucigaș. Tu fiind româncă și conectată și la realitatea din România, cum ai simțit modelul suedez și ce opinie ai asupra lui? Um, o să spun că în primă fază am fost un pic uimită de alegerile Suediei, uh, cumva văzând tot ceea ce fac vecinii. Uh, și mă refer aici la Danemarca și la Norvegia, cu precădere. Uh, 
exclud din discuție România în secunda asta. După care mi-am dat seama că modelul suedez, așa cum toată lumea îi spune, i-ar fi foarte greu de implementat în alte țări. Și o să mă refer acum la România când spun lucrul acesta și o să spun că ar fi, foarte, ar fi fost foarte greu de implementat în România dacă nu e imposibil. Pe ce s-a bazat modelul SED? S-a bazat pe mai multe lucruri. Nu, nu spun că a fost un model de succes fulminant sau nu spun că a fost cea mai bună variantă, poate, dar modelul SED s-a bazat pe mai multe lucruri. S-a bazat pe faptul că lumea va respecta exact ceea ce spun autoritățile. Și când spun va respecta exact, spun faptul că lumea chiar ține cont de ceea ce spun autoritățile, lumea atrage atenția dacă tu încalci cumva ceea ce a spus autoritatea de sănătate publică, cineva vine și îți atrage atenția, de exemplu, într-un mall. Da? Deci nu există, există, um, sunt puse pe podea, sunt puse um, indicatoare cu distanța de un metru și jumătate, doi, lumea stă acolo unde este indicat să stea. De ce spun că ar fi fost greu de implementat spre imposibil în România, dincolo de faptul că suedezii sunt destul de disciplinați în mare parte În mare parte, zic undeva la 80-85%, există excepții ca peste tot, evident Suedia este o țară în care populația este destul de dispersată Nu vorbim de aglomerații urbane foarte mari Și atunci, evident că, da, e stocul în care a fost foarte grav afectat de chestia asta, se știe, Stockholm a fost unul din polii epidemiei în Suedia um, Au fost și celelalte orașe mai mari care au fost destul de afectate Dar în rest, comunitățile sunt foarte mici Suedezii, prin definiție, sunt destul de reci ca și um, personalitate Nu au personalitatea asta caldă care o avem în noi în România Sau cum e și în Spania și în Italia, să ne întâlnim, să stăm la cafele îndelung și să vorbim și să... Nu există așa ceva și atunci toate lucrurile astea i-au ajutat. Probabil că modelul suedez ar fi avut o oarecare, un oarecare succes și în Norvegia, să spunem, țară care e undeva cam pe acolo, ca și densitate și așa mai departe. Într-adevăr, totul a fost deschis, însă lucrurile astea s-au resimțit. Toată pandemia asta și toată, toate lucrurile astea s-au resimțit în Suedia, în sensul că foarte multe magazine și-au modificat orarul, adică de la 10, să zic, în marile centre comerciale până la ora 8 în timpul săptămânii și până la 6 în weekend, acum au program de la 11 la 6 în timpul săptămânii și de la 12 la 3 în weekend sau 4 cel târziu. Sunt foarte multe businessuri care au dat faliment. În principiu pentru că lumea a fost mai atentă la cum a cheltuit banii, rata șomajului este fulminantă la momentul ăsta în Suedia, nu a avut o rată atât de mare a șomajului, cred că niciodată Și atunci lumea e foarte atentă la cum își cheltuie banul, mai mult ca oricând Există limitări în continuare de 50 de persoane, nu ai voie să ai grupuri mai mult de 50 de persoane Săptămâna aceasta Stefan Loven a anunțat că uh, nu recomand primul ministru Suedia da. uh, Inițial era spus că nu se recomandă călătorile în afara Suediei, chiar dacă celelalte țări vor deschide granițele în eventualitatea asta uh, până pe 15 iunie Um, joi, dacă nu mă înșel, Stefan Loven a revenit cu această dată și a zis până la 15 iulie Ce înseamnă lucrul ăsta? Înseamnă că dacă eu hotărăsc să, vin, să mă duc în altă țară, indiferent că e România, care e cetățean încă sunt sau oricare alta Aș avea posibilitatea și între timp rămân, um, în care trebuie să stau în carantină acolo sau mă îmbolnăvesc Angajatorul meu mă bagă automat în concediu fără plată, chiar dacă eu sunt bolnavă pentru că statul a zis, ok, noi ți-am recomandat să nu pleci Noi ți-am zis că nu e ok să pleci, ai plecat cumva pe propria ta răspundere Aia e, ți-o asum Ok, dar cum a fost văzut modelul suedez în comunitatea românească? Au acceptat ideea asta de a nu avea restricții sau s-au organizat ei singuri? Am văzut în alte țări, de exemplu, cum mafia a intervenit și a organizat carantina într-un fel cum s-a întâmplat în Suedia? Oamenii, din ce știu, minoritățile au fost mult mai afectate decât suedezii, în mod destul de disproporționat și de asta sunt curios cum au reacționat comunitatea românească. Eu cu cei care am vorbit și o să zic că m-am întâlnit cu o parte din comunitatea românească, m-am întâlnit că a fost Paștele la noi și ne-am întâlnit, s-a făcut în Viera. Și uh, s-a închiriat o capelă, am stat la înviere, am fost până în 50, cei drept, am stat la distanță unii de alții, 
Copiii și bătrânii, copiii au stat într-un colț toți, bătrânii au stat la distanță, n-au avut măști cei drept dar cred că comunitatea românească cumva a înțeles. Bine, probabil și prin prisma faptului că știau că în România e carantină și că lucrul ăsta nu-i de joacă, adică toată lumea a înțeles cumva gravitatea situației. Dar eu ce am văzut și ce am înțeles, au bucurat totuși că au cum să iasă, că pot, nu au restricții din punctul ăsta de vedere, iar au respectat foarte mult ce au spus autoritățile, inclusiv românii. Pe mine m-a bucurat lucrul ăsta. Uh, pare așa ușor, eu știu că pare ușor, uh, noi avem o problemă din asta uneori cu autoritățile de a. Uh, dar în Suedia, autoritățile în general și autoritatea de sănătate publică, ceea ce trebuie să știe toată lumea este că nu este aservită politic, cum se întâmplă uneori la noi. Și atunci toată populația are încredere că ceea ce spune autoritatea de sănătate publică spune chiar spre binele populației, nu spre binele unui partid politic sau altuia, sau a unui politician sau a altuia. Iar lucrul ăsta se vede la modul cum se comportă ei și cum pun ei în aplicare lucrurile astea. Ei nu contestă ceea ce le spun autoritățile, decât foarte rar. Adică ei pleacă de la premisa, domnule, nu are de ce să-mi vrea rău omul ăla. Omul ăla s-a gândit în primul rând la mine. Și atunci ei nu contestă lucrurile astea. E adevărat că plecăm de la. De la trebuie să pleacă și de la faptul că Suedia n-a avut războaie major. În ultima sută de ani, războ- Suedia n-a avut niciun eveniment major care să o marcheze. Și atunci ei trăiesc așa într-o bulă a lor în care totul e bine și frumos. Ei nu prea au conceptul ăsta de că lucrurile pot să fie și urâte. Iar lucrul ăsta, vorbind cu suedezii mai în vârstă, o să, o să. Eu personal l-am remarcat. Adică ei își dau seama că uneori. Realitatea din afara Suediei sau realitatea nu e chiar aia care o cred ei uneori și își dau seama de lucrul ăsta, dar au o încredere absolut, cum să zic eu, oarba aproape în autorități. Pentru că merg de la principiu, nu au cum să ne vrea rău. Sunt oameni specialiști acolo, oameni specializați care știu ce fac. Mulțumesc, mulțumesc Oana, mulțumesc pentru eu. dialogul avut în limba română. We will switch now to the English dialogue and we will start with a question on. What is the Swedish model or strategy that everyone keeps mentioning again and again and again? As from what I've noticed, at least from what the Swedish Minister of Health, Lena Hallengreen, has said, has said, is that the core of it is the trust in the people. Like trust that the people will act responsible. Do you think that's all that there is to the model or there is more to be uh, explained? Because we have to start with the beginning. People need to understand what is this. Uh, I would say I think that the trust between the people and government is one uh, building block to the model that makes it possible because instead of forcing people to stay at home or follow rules with fines, uh, the government is uh, suggesting that people follow these rules and do it voluntarily to avoid uh, congregating, to uh, have social distancing and uh, for older people and people with underlying conditions to stay at home and avoid contact with other people. So it's more of a voluntary uh, way of living your life to uh, minimize the spread of COVID rather than uh, the government uh, forcing everyone to do what they want. It's very important, I would add here, that the government has recommended people Uh, all of these measures and uh, the everyone in Sweden or almost everyone in Sweden has has taken them very seriously so the recommendation of the government in Sweden or the, the by the population in Sweden is taking uh, almost as a must um uh, but by most of of, of them and uh, that is very important I, i i found them um because yeah i'm romanian so i i uh, sometimes it's, it's fascinating to to see how it works um very disciplined people and um yeah if if uh, the politicians or the um, um someone from the authorities tell them to stay at home they will stay at home so there's no question no doubt about it Okay, but I would I would like to go if you could go deeper into this idea of trust. I mean, this sounds a bit like a risk game. Like the government hopes and that the population will self-regulate in a sense, and uh, 
it's it's a risky bet I, I can say at least from from the Danish side it looks like a risky bet so uh, what have they done to build this such level of trust that you will think and you will believe that most people or the large majority of people will just follow the recommendations with no inter restrictions I think it comes long back when uh, from every time the the government or almost every time the government have have put the people first. I think it comes on, on this trust was built in it wasn't built now. It's a trust that was built in 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 several years uh and um because of that it works like this now and it's shown from the beginning that it it okay maybe it wasn't the perfect strategy no one says that but it wasn't the the worst strategy as as well and uh from the beginning i don't know if uh, the the government has said from the beginning that sweden is trying to follow the same rules as every european country european country does that is to to ensure that uh the the people that got the disease they don't get it all in the same time but sweden is trying to do it in a different way so basically yeah i know it sounds like they did total the total opposite of what every other european country has done but because of the trust that was built between the government and the people and because of the fact that uh from the beginning i think the results were quite good we're we're going to talk for sure about the number of deaths also but yeah the 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 people stayed at home and the people uh, responded positive to to what the government and the authorities uh said to them i think uh, that just put another like yeah we did the right thing it's the right way to go uh and in the same time i would add that every single day at two o'clock um uh, we had press conferences how the day before it went how it's going to work they adjusted every day if it needed adjustments they were done on daily basis so the communication during this time i think it was absolutely marvelous i agree with oana also i think the trust between the citizens and the government and institutions has been built up over a long time and so that made it possible for the government now to rely on the citizens to be responsible adults and follow the rules and do what's best for society Okay, thank you. Uh, but some people say that maybe actually it is more of a the the plan was based on the fact that uh, the general health of the population uh, permitted this model in a sense that you know that uh, Sweden has the world lowest rate of obesity, which it's a condition that makes COVID nineteen more deadly, and it has a generally disease resistant population. And even like uh, in Stockholm, half of the housing are single person housing, so there is an easier social distancing. So, do you think that the general health of the population allowed maybe this model? Uh, I I will start this and let Gabriel because yeah. he has more more insight on the. Um, I, I I said from the beginning that the Swedish model is very hard to replicate in other countries because of the fact how Swedish are as persons, um, and because of the fact that we don't have a lot of people in big cities like I don't know how many millions. So yeah, we we have a lot of people that live alone. Uh, Sweden is known for one of the countries that most of more than 40% of the people live alone uh, in the house. Um, so yeah, and because of that, it was easily made. The social distancing was m easily made. We can that's that's for sure. Um, so that helped. I don't know. Yeah, Swedes Swedes are people that do a lot of sport. I don't know if uh, if their health is better than than in other countries, but what is for sure is the fact that they live longer, and that is due to the fact that they take quite good care about their health. Um, and uh, every time. Uh, from my point of view i see that every time they take the decision to prescribe something they they put into balance very well what's the risk if it's in the best benefit of the patient to write one medicine extra or not or we can solve it with lifestyle we can solve it with the with the, the way we eat the way we we live our lives so yeah that that was a plus for them for sure yeah i think also the that the way the society is 
built up with a lot of single households and the uh, Swedish culture or people behave in a sort of half socially distant way already. So it was an easy transition, maybe more easy than uh, easily than in other cultures. So I'm not sure if the Swedish people are more healthy, exceptionally more healthy than other people, but I think the whole society was more, uh, it was easier to transition to a more socially distancing way of life already. And uh, with, like we talked before, the trust between the citizens and the government also. Okay, thank you. We have now a question from, uh, from a person who's watching this show. Um, Ioana Maria Pavel, she said that what studies have been used to uh, to create this model or how did they decide to, imp to not impose quarantine? I don't think there were any studies involved in this decision because we, we can't say we have a lot of studies that we, we, Gabriel has more, is an expert in that, but it's a brand new virus. So we can't, we can't say we have a lot of studies. We don't know how it will develop. Uh, and actually, no other country that it has imposed quarantine can say either that it won't explode. Look, for instance, what happened in Germany when they opened a little more. So no country at all can, can say, yeah, it won't explode anything when schools will start in August or September again. So no one can know for sure what will happen. Um, yeah, and to be honest, if we're talking from that point of view, uh, until a vaccine is made, the only thing possible is to yeah to to try to 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 keep it into place everything so um i think the the the, the swedish decision was not made on some studies um the, the fact that they didn't impose quarantine was thought economically in the same time and they 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 admitted that that they thought how the economy will get hit if they close everything uh, and we see now, even in Sweden, we see that a lot of people lost their jobs. It is a problem. It is a real problem that they 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 confront with and uh, a problem that needs to be fixed. And they already said, the government already said that it will take up to two years for this, the amount of people that is are without a job right now to, to have a job again. So that will take a long time to, to get, even if Sweden has not closed everything. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of businesses that uh, went bankrupt in, under this period. So a lot of things happened anyway, even if they don't, uh, if they didn't close everything. Um, the flights, it wasn't any restrictions to the flights. The problem was that the other countries closed their borders. So actually, yeah, from Sweden you could have gone anywhere, but yeah, it was hard to get anywhere. Let's put it this way. So. Um, from that point of view, everything was recommended. It wasn't imposed in any way because, again, they thought that the, the people can think for themselves and can can make the better the better decision for their families, for their sake, for their health. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the public health ministry probably looked at all the studies and early case reports that were coming out from from China and Italy in the beginning, uh, but the, like Oana said, there was there is not so much evidence for the different um, methods to prevent this from this virus. But they could look at previous viruses like the SARS virus and flu and other to compare. But it seemed early on that there was not uh, so much evidence that children, for example, were spreading the virus. And so the Swedish government decided not to close the schools. And they were contemplating possibly also quarantine, but figuring that you can only have the quarantine for a limited time and it's very big stress on the society. So they would save it for when it has the most usefulness. And in the beginning, just trying to slow down the spread of the virus while still keeping society open and functioning. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. But I'm now. I just want to put you a, a question: What is herd immunity? Because I heard this a lot in 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 connection with the Swedish model. Could you please explain to our viewers what is herd immunity? Well, when we talk about herd immunity for other viruses that we vaccinate against, you want to have a very high percentage of the population. 
to have an immunity through vaccinations or passing or having had the disease. So maybe 90, 95%, which would then prevent the virus from spreading because so many people in society already have uh, an immune system that it recognizes the virus. But now for this new virus, we were hoping to get 60, 70% maybe, uh, a sufficient portion of the population to have immunity. So the virus can't spread so easily. So it will slow down even more. And then maybe in a year's time, hopefully we can have a, a vaccine. And in the meantime, try to protect the most vulnerable in society the elderly with underlying conditions. So the idea of having society open and letting the virus spread, especially among the young people who will not be so severely sick from it, can build up a herd immunity in the society to protect the uh, elderly and the most vulnerable. Thank you. Uh, one thing that I have heard a lot is that maybe the Swedish model or the Swedish strategy is a preparation for the second wave. I know everyone thinks about this mythical second wave. Is it going to come? Is it going to be in two months? Is it ever going to even be there? So uh, like if, if we are to listen to the chief epidemiologist Anders Tegnell of, of Sweden, he says that uh, the reproduction rate and the spread will be slower because of the, the strategy employed. So uh, do you agree with that? Do you think that this helps Sweden with a second wave, or do you even believe there will be a second wave? Well, the Spanish flu in 1918 came, started in the spring, and then there was a smaller wave in the beginning of over summer, and then it came back and was worse during the second wave in winter when it uh, coincided with the regular flu season. So we don't know, but it's likely that it could come back and be more severe in the winter time when it's easier for viruses to spread anyway, like during the flu season. And in that way, I think it could be good for Sweden to have built up a partial uh, herd immunity in the summer now uh, to make the next wave spread slower. But, uh, Wana? No, 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 I, I totally agree with Gabriel. The, the, um, the possibility of a second wave is, is there. We must admit that. And we must admit as well as as soon as the, all the restrictions will be over everywhere, the, this possibility will grow essentially. And as soon as the schools will be open and everyone will be in school, uh, again, the, the, we, it's not something that we can contain at the moment in any in any way. We can we can stay in quarantine our whole lives until the vaccine comes. And as as soon as we will have that possibility, of course, things will be more simpler. But at the moment, the only way, which is not the best way for the elderly, but yeah, for the rest of the population, it's the herd immunity. It's the only path we can go, even if it sounds a little bit, yeah, harsh for some uh, for some people. But there is also the problem that uh, herd immunity, or it's based on the fact that we will produce uh, some antibodies, or the people who got infected will produce antibodies. Do you? Some many scientists are saying that maybe that's not uh, yet verified. We do not know if uh, these antibodies will produce a herd immunity at some point. Well, we've seen uh, from early serological studies uh, that uh, depending on how severe the disease is, the higher amount of antibodies you will produce. So if you have a mild disease, some studies in Sweden have showed 70% have detectable antibodies. Well, if you have a more severe disease, maybe 80, 90% would get antibodies after that. But because it's a new virus, we don't know how long those antibodies will stay. So we don't know if you have immunity for uh, one year, two years or longer. Okay. I think the I think the problem the immunity if we we base ourselves on what happened with other viruses, immunity will be achieved. Uh, in the persons that already contacted the virus. The problem, as Gabriel said, the problem now is how long will you have that immunity? And that's the real problem that every country will confront sooner or later because no one knows for sure. So yeah, if it's like six, six months, then we'll have a problem during winter when our immune system is already a little bit weaker and the possibility in catching something from a simple flu to COVID-19 is, is bigger, it raises, it rises. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about economy now. 
Uh, I know that uh, there's many times has been invoked this lower economic cost of the Swedish strategy in comparison to other EU states. Uh, but does that even hold true? Because if you're looking at the Swedish central bank uh, predictions, they say that there will be a major recession anyway. There will be a, a re- 6.9% to 9.7% reduction in GDP in GDP. So uh and, and if I'm looking at Denmark, Denmark will have a 6% to 6.5%, Norway 5.5%. I'm looking at the uh, European Union which announced a 7.4% re- recession. I mean, so in in a sense uh, there is there is no lower economic cost to the Swedish uh, model if you think about it. Like uh what what do you, what do you think about it sweden by default is a very socialist country sweden helps uh every ci- or they try to help every citizen in every single way so what sweden or the government of sweden did in this period they have uh, taken from the employers a lot of stuff uh for example i'll give you a first example um in sweden you can stay at home a week without any proof from your doctor if you're sick you will get paid 80%. Uh the first day you weren't paid at all. It was called Karen's dog. You weren't paid at all. So the the rest of the four days you were paid 80%. Now the government has taken so you are paid from day one if you feel sick just to prevent spreading the disease if yeah you will you will see if it's a cold or an allergy or you had a headache I don't know. But the state has taken everything every single and uh, this this cost as well so there are a lot of costs that the state has taken from the employers now that have have cost economy a lot so there there um i was uh, i was um, i was looking yesterday evening and they they say they will pump 6.3% i think to re to try to restart the economy um so yeah it's a lot of things that happen now but the problem is i think uh, and you, you mentioned norway and denmark i think you went uh, you went from uh, from my point of view econ- your economies or norway's economy was a little bit better from the beginning than sweden's at the moment so i think that's that's to be taken into consideration as well hmm. and sweden has a as a exporting economy so of course it will yeah. affect the big industries in Sweden if they cannot export to other european countries for example because they have lockdowns and closed borders and such so maybe for the big picture the big industries will be affected more or less the same as other european countries but hopefully it will help maybe the smaller businesses in the in the community maybe the restaurants and cafes and local uh local businesses on a smaller scale can still operate and work more or less normally the government already said in sweden uh, i think it was this week that they will um, uh, loan the the small businesses with uh, 70 75000 crowns swedish crowns so that's um, in euros it will be yeah they will guarantee a loan just to get them started at the moment after after the pandemic so they don't have to fire people so they they i think sweden i don't know about too much about the other countries but i i think the government and the state has taken a lot just to help the employers from paying the rent they they offered help in paying the rent for small businesses just to survive um and it, yeah okay maybe it's not a lot but if you count all together that's for a country that's a lot of a lot of money that that's building up okay but so you know in a sense you agree to the fact that eco- uh, economy or lower economic cost is not exactly a a, stro- a strong point of the swedish model you were affected just as badly as any other uh, european union state so uh, a lot of conservatives and libertarians around the world are using the Swedish model to say, oh, we could have prevented the economy to go into shreds. That's not real. That's not true. The Swedish economy is just as hit and it's just as dependent on the other economies. So Sweden alone could never uh, employ this model to save the economy. So I don't think economy played a role in creating this model. Do you agree with that? 
I think the economy could have been hit a, a lot more if they that was a total lockdown. But yeah, Sweden is not a, a, an island that works alone and it can stand alone. So uh, as Gabriel said, Sweden, uh, Sweden economy, Sweden exports a lot. And that was seen now. And uh, yeah, it took a, bit hit, a big hit on, a, on the economy. And I think uh, from my point of view, it has to do um, a lot with the people that that didn't buy as much as they used to buy before. Okay. So Swedish people became very, very careful in how much money they, 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 they uh, left at the supermarket, for example or i don't know in some so you can see a lot of uh, clothing stores that went into bankruptcy because of that um because people don't spend as much money anymore they're really really careful and i don't think it has to do only with sweden they say what they see what happens around sweden and they they think a little bit more about the future and the fact that they they're their job could be affected at, at some point. And I have colleagues that work now only 60%. So because it's not needed to work that much anymore. We don't have in the pharmacies that not many customers, patients anymore. So we don't need to have it open that much. Not as many places open that much. Okay. So, yeah, because of that, you, you think twice in how you will spend your money. But, yeah, the, the Swedish economy got hit anyway with or without with or without uh, staying at home we can say it like this the swedish economy got hit and that was because uh, the small restaurants and co coffee places uh, i think people didn't dare to go there anymore okay that's that's uh, interesting uh, but i'm i'm actually curious now is the swedish model uh, popular among the swedes and also among the non swedes because i'm i'm if they look around, they see, okay, in Denmark, 500 something deaths, in Norway, 200, Finland, also around 200, but in, in Sweden, over 3,500. Do you think people are, might be getting that maybe this was a serious mistake that the government has done? So do, do you feel like the, 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 the people start to get, start to blame the government uh, now that the numbers are coming out? No, uh, I. I most, sorry. Yeah. No, no, Gabriel, please, please. <laughs> uh, no, I think most Swedes are happy or content and support this uh, the strategy, because it's not only about the economy or the and the the broader picture. Also, I think is the well being, the psychological well being of the citizens, and I think most people have been able to live more or less a normal life, rather than being. Uh, in quarantine and because with the model the swedish model has been able to manage the amount of sick people in the hospitals all the hospitals in sweden have been able to manage uh, with some adaptations to more intensive care units so it's been a manageable uh, bent curve still while people have been able to enjoy their normal freedoms so my impression is that most uh, Swedes are supporting the government's strategy. Thank you. What about the non-Swedes, Anna? Um, there we have a little bit <laughs> of problems. Yeah, uh, the non-Swedes, I think a lot of people that live in Sweden um, have thought of the whole problem or a bit of for the problem fr from what happened in their own countries. Uh, and I talked with, I, I worked with, with, um, with people that came from um, Bosnia or Serbia and I, I don't get it. Why don't they close everything? Look, people come into the pharmacy, they're sick. I don't want to get sick. So it was, um, from that point of view, I think it is a little bit of, uh, of how we see the problem. But uh, I think it comes mostly because in our country, the politic is involved in every every level every every single institution and uh, i think from from a from my point of view as a romanian for me it was very hard to accept their uh, trust in the in the institutions uh but i i, I was talking with a with a colleague that's also from romania uh and uh, a few days ago and she was like yeah i trust the institutions i can honestly say that i trust the institutions so i think in, in some point you see Okay, there are a lot more deaths in Sweden. We all know that those deaths come from the from the homes, from the elderly. Uh, yes, 
uh, Anders Stegnell ha has said, I'm sorry, we didn't thought it through. Uh, I'm so sorry we didn't thought about our elderly as much. I, 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 I honestly, I felt that I had customers that were in that group of risk and said, yeah, it seems like the state doesn't care about us anymore. So from that point of view, I can honestly say that uh, the communication wasn't that great. I think that the government and the authorities should have addressed them, the elderly, a little bit more, not just stay at home. Should have addressed the whole message like we're thinking about you, we're trying to protect you. Don't think that if you come to the hospital, no one will take you. Don't think that we will leave you outside the hospital because we need that bed for someone that is younger. It's a tough call. It's a tough choice. We all know that. Okay, I get it. It's a very tough choice if you have to choose to give that bed to a 40 years old that with, has no other, uh, other uh, diseases or no other problems, health problems, major health problems, or an elderly. But in the same time, we must take into, the consideration, into consideration the fact that Swedes live a lot, a lot more than we, we have uh, in Romania. So the yeah, you have people in their 80s, a lot of them uh, that are like going to the supermarkets, going to take a coffee, uh, active, we can say that. So yeah, of course, at that age, you will have some other disease, you will have a blood pressure, you will have something else that won't be your best friend in times of need, we can say that. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the people that moved to Sweden, and I'm not talking about uh, Eastern Europeans or only Europeans, um, they, were, um, they weren't that happy, we can say that. But uh, in the end, they, I think they adjusted to the situation. And okay. uh, I, I, I saw that people that wear masks and gloves more, they're not Swedes that many. Okay, so there, so there's you, some people who wear masks and gloves actually yeah, in, in now, Sweden. Uh, yeah, I they more the last two weeks because we we didn't have them as yeah it was a problem with those uh, materials um, as it was in all over Europe uh, and everything that Sweden got it was uh, diverted to to a personnel that worked in healthcare in hospitals. Um, which was normal, absolutely. Uh, they were the first ones that fought uh, against this. Um, but now, because they can, they can, sh they can buy them. Um, you you see some of them, but most of them that you can see that elder, they are um, older, and uh, they most of them aren't Swedes. And what was the authorities told us um, a few days ago? Uh, take into the consideration that sometimes we use poorly uh, even the the gloves you can uh, you can take viruses all over the city because we don't change our gloves every time you we you go to a shop or something you should throw them when you go out disinfect your hands and put a new pair when you need to to go to another shop if you don't want to touch anything Unfortunately, we don't do that. And the risk that you will spread some, some germs, even if it's COVID-19 or something else, it's bigger if you do like that, because you don't disinfect your, your gloves. Okay, thank you so much, Ruana. Uh, Gabriel, I will have the last question for, uh, for tonight. I, you work in hospital. Please tell me what is the situation right now there from the, you know, from the first line. You're a first liner after all. Yeah, so the situation in my hospital is that we were preparing for a big influx, big wave of patients that many people would get sick, uh, but it hasn't really become that way. So we have changed parts of the hospital, expanded to another part of the hospital, more beds, more spaces, more uh, work doctors and nurses and everything in prepare preparation. But it hasn't really become that way, so we've only had well, on my island, not even so many cases, uh, eight patients in total in the hospital with COVID-19, and uh, three patients have died in, in a population of uh, 60, 70,000, uh, on 66 cases in total on the island. 
We must say as well as Sweden, when this pandemic began, we, we started about 500 beds in ICU, I think. It was around the country. And now um, we are at 1,200 beds. Uh, and we're not talking about beds. We're talking about beds with equipment uh, because only the beds won't help us. So from that point of view, I think uh, Sweden uh, didn't go first as a winner, um, but it moved quite well. They 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 moved quite fast in uh, in getting uh, everything that uh, that was needed. And now we have around today it was around 318, 390 people in ICU. So it's it's not that much. It's the lower uh, the 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 um, we we get fewer and fewer every day. Th thank you both uh, for participating in this uh, morning podcast. I'm looking forward to visit Sweden again sometime, maybe next year, though. <laughs> uh, you can already. From, because from the Danish yeah. side, everyone is like, let's open the border with Germany, but not with Sweden, not yet, maybe next year, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Just not, not now. You not just you can already because we let you in and danish people must let you in again because uh yeah, yeah you yeah, have I residency know. there so um, please come yes. <laughs> for a coffee <laughs> Uh, mulțumesc tuturor celor care ne-au ascultat la cafeaua de dimineață. Vă invit să urmăriți pagina Tinerii Europeni pentru a nu pierde nicio emisiune Bună dimineața Europa sau Liber despre Europa. Ne găsiți de asemenea pe YouTube, pe pagina cu același nume, dar și în format audio pe Anchor și Spotify. Găsiți linkurile în descrierea acestui post pe data viitoare și de asemenea un shout-out către Izabela Iordan pentru sacrificiul de a te trezi la ora 5 pentru a viziona acest podcast.